In the fall of 1945, Frank McClure, the president of Westminster College, conceived a bold idea to invite Winston Churchill to deliver a lecture at the college. Westminster alumnus Major General Harry Vaughan, a military aide at the White House, showed the invitation to Missouri's native son, President Harry Truman. Truman scrawled a handwritten note at the bottom of the Westminster invitation. This is a wonderful school in my home state. Hope you can do it. I'll introduce you. Best regards, Harry Truman. With this endorsement, Churchill accepted. So on March 5, 1946, Winston Churchill and Harry Truman arrived at Westminster College. It was less than one year after the war's end in Europe, and Churchill was watching the Soviet Union's actions in Eastern Europe with increasing concern. Here at Westminster College, he was to deliver one of the most famous speeches of his career. Neither the sure prevention of war nor the continuous rise of world organization will be gained without what I have called the fraternal association of the English-speaking peoples. This means a special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States of America, a shadow had fallen upon the scenes so lately lightened, lighted by the Allied victory. Uh, no, no, nobody knows what Soviet Russia and its communist international organization intends to do in the immediate future, or what are the limits, if any, to their expansive and proselytizing tendency. From Stettin in the Baltic, to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. Whatever conclusions may be drawn from these facts, in fact they are, this is certainly not the liberated Europe we fought to build up, nor is it one which contains the essentials of permanent peace. Twice the United States has had to send several millions of its young men across the Atlantic to find the war. But now, war can find any nation, wherever it may dwell, between dusk and dawn. I do not believe that Soviet Russia desires war. What they desire is the fruits of war and the indefinite expansion of their power and doctrines. Uh, but what we have to consider here today, while time remains, is the permanent prevention of war and the establishment of conditions of freedom and democracy as rapidly as possible in all countries. <clears throat> our difficulties and dangers will not be removed by closing our eyes to them. They will not be removed by mere waiting to see what happens, nor will they be removed by a policy of appeasement. What is needed is a settlement, and the longer this is delayed, the more difficult it will be, and the greater our dangers will become. There never was a war in history easier to prevent by timely action than the one which has just desolated such great areas of the globe. It could have been prevented, in my belief, without the firing of a single shot, and Germany might be powerful, prosperous, and honored today. But no one would listen. And one by one, we were all sucked into the awful whirlpool. Miss Shirley, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you, surely we must not let that happen again. Immediate reaction to the speech was guarded. Many accused Churchill of warmongering and were suspicious of his proposed military alliance between the English-speaking peoples. 
In time, it became clear that the speech was an accurate warning about the Cold War to come. <laughs>